Hello and welcome to PL Talks. I'm Reese Martin, an arcing student with Pool Lawyers, a law firm based here in Calgary, Alberta. For those new to PL Talks and those who've been away for a while, PL Talks is a passion project of our firm where we sit down with artists and discuss their work. We started this project to feature Alberta artists and over the pandemic we've increased our scope to sit down with various Canadian artists. But today we're returning to our roots and I am joined by the fantastic artist uh, based here in Alberta, Catherine Smith. Catherine is a trans uh, non-binary director, designer, and creator who has worked on projects across Canada for the last 10 years. They have worked on and created a multitude of projects, including their own award-winning clown, puppet, and new creation productions. Their focus lies in the collective creation, queer stories, and the ecology of the ensemble. Catherine is the artistic director of Verb Theatre and member of the Mudfoot Theatre Collective. They have worked on with many theatre companies here in Calgary as a designer and director, including Virgo Theatre, Downstage Theatre, Handsome Alice, Theatre Calgary, Alberta Theatre Projects, Lunchbox Theatre, and Sage Theatre. Catherine is also an award-winning singer-songwriter and sound designer uh, under the name K.P. Smith. Their music can be found on all major stream services. I would also like to add that they are an amazing person who I've had the pleasure and privilege to work with and receive mentorship from <laughs> on a number of projects before my current career. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you, Reese. Thanks for having me. Uh, the honor's all mine. Uh, <laughs> so, Catherine, yeah, clearly, so much work, so many creative uh, endeavors that you're in, but it seems like right now you're doing more directing. Is that so? Yeah, I'm mostly primarily focusing on directing and theater, mm -hmm. um, which also comes with its fair share of creative work and collective creation too. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, I started uh, primarily as a designer for mm -hmm. theater. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I really do believe that once you've designed enough in theater, you'll become actually a really excellent director. Excellent. Yeah, so I've, I've, I've moved on mostly to directing. It was always my hope mm -hmm. and goal to be primarily a theater director. Uh, when I went to school, I focused on the tech side of things, got mm -hmm. a really good understanding of design, of all facets of design. Um, and I think I've worked in almost like every position that you can in theater at this point. Um, I mean, that happened. That kind of does. happens with the nature of the art. After. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You, you just get shuffled around a little bit and, and get to learn about every single job. <laughs> um, so, so now I am mostly directing and really fortunate to be doing that because uh, I, if folks don't know directing, there's usually just the one directing position mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. one show. And if you think about it, if there is a... Um, a season of a theater company that has five shows, that means there's only five jobs for that year. Absolutely. Yeah, so I'm really, really fortunate to be doing what I'm doing. 100%. And just to dive into that a bit more, like, what about, direct, about directing pulled you to that over, say, design? Uh, I, what a great question uh, to, like, think back on. <laughs> why do I love it so much? Yeah. Uh, I, I have a very vivid imagination. Mm -hmm. I love mm -hmm. to consider images. Uh, and also consider like how a show can impact an audience. Mm -hmm. And I think a director's job, a lot of people often think that a director's job is to make a show what they want it to be. Mm -hmm. But I actually believe that uh, such a large part of directing is actually just communicating with a group of people and getting all of it, like getting the whole team to be able to collaborate and mesh their visions together. So I love working with people in that aspect, working with other artists, learning from other artists as to how we can get the show to be its best version of itself. Mm -hmm. um, and directing, you get to like dig into the text of a show. Mm -hmm. You get to dig into the design, to like little moments. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for folks who like haven't done a, a lot of directing or even like seen a lot of theater or film, the next time, I'd encourage people that the next time they watch something like even a TV show or a film, uh, to look at every aspect, like mm -hmm. the lighting, the performance, the camera angle, if it's theater, listen to the sound, mm -hmm. uh, look at the set design, and then consider that there was one person who was trying to organize and manage all of that. Abs absolutely. Uh, you know, as a regular theater goer myself, I, I always feel it's a bit hard to f necessarily sense the presence of the director at times when it gets lost in things, but sometimes when you look at the individual choices of the piece, 
that's where you find the through line of directing, would you say? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's such a common thing, too, yeah. is like people are like, I can't tell if the directing was good or if the directing <laughs> was bad. Mm -hmm. it's, it is hard to tell. Like, even mm -hmm. sometimes I go to shows, I'm like, I can't really tell. And I shouldn't say good or bad. Mm -hmm. Directing isn't isn't just one of those two things. Yeah. It's like, but it can be tricky to see what specific choice might have been the director. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I feel like after you go to enough shows and you start getting a trained eye, uh, like using like even this set that we're on right now as an example, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, there's things that clearly the designer's choice was, like perhaps the designer's choice was having like these three lamps in the background. Mm -hmm. um, but a director's choice might have been like how the actor works with those set pieces. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so it, it, it is tricky though. I think it's a skill. It's a skill that you learn over time. Absolutely. And since you brought it up and we've been burying the lead long enough, uh, today we are on the set of Verve Theater's latest show, uh, We're Gonna Die, <laughs> by uh, Young Jean Lee, um, which you are the director of. Yes. Uh, so tell us a bit about like, about the piece, like, uh, unfortunately, it will be closed by the time this goes up. But, you know, why this piece? What what drew you to it? Young Jean Lee, uh, as a playwright, is one of the most um, prolific experimental playwrights. Mm -hmm. She's in the States, mm -hmm. uh, but her work has become really renowned internationally. Uh, we're gonna die. I, I have to give props to the old artistic director of Verb. Mm -hmm. I just started running Verb Theater this season. Mm -hmm. The old artistic director was named Jamie Dunstan. She also started Verb Theater. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as she was leaving, we were sitting down and having meetings to pass the company over to myself. Uh, and she was like, I think you'd like this script. And she's actually the one who suggested the show. Okay. And, and just said, I think you should check the script out. You'd be a big fan. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I watched an archival version of it, I listened to the music, I read the script, and I instantly fell in love. And I think, to answer your question, why this show right now, like what makes me so drawn to it, it's because it feels really relevant. Um, <laughs> I know it's I, the title, yeah. the title's a little misleading yeah. in the sense that people are like, that's going to be really depressing. But it's actually like Young Jean Lee literally calls it a show that is a life affirming exploration about the one thing that we all have in common. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just about death. The themes in the show are also about uh, like different kinds of loss and mm -hmm. grief and big change that you have in your life. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was really appealing to me because right now I think audiences want that reminder that we are in this together, that we're mm -hmm. a community of people who experience something at the same time, or have that ability to experience something at the same time. Uh, absolutely, and I personally can confirm, despite the title, quite uplifting, even, yeah. with, uh, <laughs> even with the audience participation at the end, it's making us all sing, uh, we're gonna <laughs> die. It's like, quite quite pleasant, despite, yeah. despite the tone. <laughs> um, so, you know, let, not just director, but artistic director, mm -hmm. uh, the fanciest of the directors, if you will. Um, <laughs> Tell, tell us a little bit about what that and what that means for you as kind of like, if I may, like helming verb theater here. And I, I was reading your website and I was quite struck by the mission statement of the company, if I may quote, uh, that your mission is to provide our audiences theatrical experiences that explore cutting edge ideas in cutting edge ways. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a bit about what that means to you? Yeah, absolutely. So it, what I will say is interesting, just as like mm -hmm. information for people who might be watching this, mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes the artistic director can shape the mandate of a company to what mm -hmm. they think it should be. Mm -hmm. um, I was uh, given verb theater with this mandate, but one of the reasons I applied for the job is because I love the mandate. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another phrase that we have on our website and that we use a lot for verb theater is tomorrow's theater today. Mm -hmm. Um, so this idea of exploring ideas in a cutting edge way, uh, it, it could mean, but isn't strictly related to having like high end tech on yeah. stage, uh, exploring how we can relay stories to audiences. Yeah. That's not just a direct, um, uh, deliver of a story. Yeah. Uh, for example, this show, um, mm -hmm. there is direct address to the audience. Mm -hmm. It's all done over mic, um, a microphone. Um, and it's all true stories that aren't true to the author of the show, mm -hmm. but are true stories from her life. 
Um, all that being said, the monologues are all strung together with live music. Um, and the, what you're referencing at the end when everyone gets to sing together, mm -hmm. I think is like a bit of an unorthodox way to end a show. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would say like Verb's mandate and our desire is to continue finding ways to really bring the audience in and be able to explore these ideas uh, in a way that other theater companies aren't doing. Sure. Um, uh, which really excites me because I, I'm personally a big fan of going to the theater and feeling challenged. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, I think that's one of that and storytelling are really the core elements of like of what theater does, I think, better than any other art form. Yeah, I would agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fully. So, Catherine, uh, Verb is also, you know, what we would call a bit of an indie theater company. Um, and how do you feel creating a company like that versus you know, your larger regional theater, like your theater Calgary, your Cal uh, Citadel Theater. Mm -hmm. like. Yeah, indie, so indie theater is referring specifically to independent mm -hmm. theater. Mm -hmm. um, Verb Theater is a not-for-profit theater company, um, which like any other not-for-profit sort of buzzword that mm -hmm. you hear, uh, mm -hmm. it means that we uh, are not doing this to earn money for ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, we receive grants from the mm -hmm. government, and we want to do art for the sake of the community and support artists. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd say we're we're quite different from like a regional theater company like Theater Calgary mm -hmm. or Vertigo because well a we're we're much smaller. <laughs> yes, tiny, uh, tiny. Yeah. If uh, for folks who are listening, uh, indie companies um, operate often off of like three to four people. Mm -hmm. uh, if that, I should actually say more like between one and four people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, for example, Verb, uh, I am almost full time as the artistic director, but I'm not even quite full time. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have an artistic associate, Camille Pavlenko, uh, who's uh, who's like kind of like a part time mm -hmm. person. And then that's it. Yep. <laughs> There's nobody else. Um, but I think what indie theater does really, really well, uh, not at all. One's not better than the other between being an indie company and a regional company, but something indie companies do really well is they have uh, they have so much flexibility and room to play. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of regional companies, which is fantastic, also have a really uh, hearty subscriber base, mm -hmm. or they have people who know that when they come to Vertigo Theater, for example, they will see uh, murder mystery and true mm -hmm. crime. Mm -hmm. uh, stories and Vertigo is fantastic. Yep. Um, the nice, the the nice thing and cool thing about indie companies is that uh, we can continue being flexible. We can experiment and explore a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd say that there's something wonderful about having companies where you're like, I know if I go there, this is the art I'm receiving. Mm -hmm. But for indie companies, you might get to see something that you won't see anywhere else. And it's like a one-time thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Like that, that's always kind of been my experience of, you know, the indie companies are where, where you get to see the cool and weird art. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of like that. You know, <laughs> yeah. Albeit, you know, there, there are indie companies that still do your fairly, you know, mainstream uh, performances. Uh, and so, Catherine, uh, as a director, like, let, let's kind of dive into a bit of the art you like doing. Like, what draws you to a script, per se? Yeah, I so many factors. Um, mm -hmm. I, so many factors. I'm thinking through like the themes that I'm really drawn to. I'm often uh, specifically drawn to queer work. Mm -hmm. um, myself as a queer artist, mm -hmm. I want to see those stories on stage. I want to see that celebrated. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's not just that, it's also stuff with uh, stuff, meaning shows with strong <laughs> images, Absolutely. Uh, strong design ideas, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. stories that I'm really attracted to. This show is a great example. The story attracted me, but also the music. Absolutely. So like the container. I'm really drawn to shows with music, mm -hmm. not musicals necessarily. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. I think one day it would be really fascinating to be able to direct like a 50 person musical absolutely comes with its own challenges but mm. also like triumphs mm -hmm. um uh, but i love shows that have music inherently sort of woven into the story absolutely uh, and most people do like music mm. is like a language mm. that we can all relate to mm -hmm. i feel 
uh, that sometimes you don't need the words or lyrics attached to the music. Like it really speaks to a lot of folks in different ways. Um, so those are some shows that I'm interested in. A absolutely, <laughs> I think that aligns with some of the work that I've seen recently from you since why I took her way was a lot of really more, more focus on storytelling than necessarily the traditional structured narrative. Yeah. Uh, the musical aspects, of course. Um, and the one thing I won't forgive you for, uh, audience participation. <laughs> uh, although I will say when I saw Country Shaped Like Stars, I did appreciate getting free candy. Yeah. <laughs> Well, audience participation, it's funny that you say that because I'm like, I don't actually do, now nah, I'm about to lie, I do a lot of shows with audience participation, mm -hmm. but I really do try to consider that not everyone wants that. Yeah. So we actually set up a really specific system with performers. Uh, I have performers often in my shows who can read the audience really well. Mm -hmm. They can tell pretty quickly, I never want to make anyone do something they don't want to do. Mm -hmm. I think they get a pretty good read as soon as they walk up to someone, if they like turn their eyes away, <laughs> don't want to talk to you, don't want to look at the performer, they're like, no problem, I will yep. go to a different person. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think <laughs> audience interaction can be really scary, mm -hmm. but it can also like help bond an audience to the show no, really abso clearly. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I, I do uh, I do a lot of like puppetry and clown work, mm -hmm. which clown, I think I'm realizing a lot of people will hear the phrase, I do a lot of clown work and that <laughs> sounds like scary. Um, <laughs> But fair, fair. by that I mean uh, clown's like a, a really specific art form mm -hmm. in theater. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's maybe somebody even just wearing a red nose and it's more of like a physicalization and um, exploration of joy mm -hmm. uh, so it's not like try not to picture a birthday clown picture yeah. like a, a more like sort of nuanced uh, style of performance but anyways both puppetry and clown um, and a lot of music too mm -hmm. really relies on the audience interaction and the ability to play and be mm -hmm. involved with the audience is so so key absolutely yeah um, I am sorry. No, no, no. That, that, <laughs> for uh, your like, discomfort. Uh, I will get over it. Uh, I already <laughs> have. <laughs> but, you know, such a broad, like, even in that, it seems like there's a lot of broad topics and themes you like playing with. So in your role as an AD, how do you go about selecting a season and putting that together? Yeah, great question. Uh, especially for indie companies, mm -hmm. uh, for any company, the, f the first things to consider, I think, are uh, what are the themes and stories we want to explore this season? Um, what scale of production can we do mm -hmm. is a huge one. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. I have read scripts that I adore, and then uh, I sit back and realize it's, it's seven actors. Mm -hmm. I can't do that. Mm -hmm. And the reason I can't is because, um, con <laughs> contrary to popular, popular belief, uh, a lot of folks I'm realizing recently think like, oh, it's kind of like volunteering. It's like community theater. I'm like, oh, no, no. it's not at all. <laughs> like, it's, it, it's quite expensive mm -hmm. to hire multiple actors, mm -hmm. um, to hire multiple anything. So anyways, um, I, I think when choosing a season, Story is most important, but then scale as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to exhaust your team by trying to do a 50 person musical Absolutely. as a company that's run by two people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and, and you want to choose things that excite you too. Uh, and, and you think will excite audiences as well. Uh, for Verb Theater in particular, I look for shows that have that little bit of a twist. Mm -hmm. Like, how do we respond to the audience? Uh, what is the container of the story? Um, and, and how is that different from what other theater might be exploring? Absolutely. Um, and, and like I've said before, like the themes of uh, social uh, workings and how our society operates and communicates, I'm really interested in that. Absolutely, and on that last point, how, how much does contemporary, like what's happening in the news or globally influence that decision, if at all, on what you're selecting? Uh, it's funny, like, I think we can all relate to this. I feel like the news changes radically every mm -hmm. day, because it does, because we discover new, wonderful and often horrible <laughs> things every day in the news. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, I mean, art has always responded to to what's happening outside in the world, to what's mm -hmm. happening to us politically. There's often that conversation about how will we stay relevant 
if we can't keep up with the news. Mm -hmm. um, I personally, like especially right now with, with everything that's happening with trans and queer youth, um, with bills that are being passed in the States, and a lot of like, uh, mm -hmm. a, a lot of intensity here in Canada too, around mm -hmm. like queer people and drag performance. Um, I think that's really influencing a lot of uh, the indie companies in town here. Mm -hmm. um, then you ask yourself the question, is me doing a show, say I do a show that features a drag performer, mm -hmm. Is that, like, <laughs> is it enough to just be like, we did a show that had this, yeah. when really a company should also be considering how you're supporting that artist in the process, mm -hmm. um, how you're approaching that content. What is the content? Is it is it joyful content or is it just a cycle of uh, damaging stories being told? Um, so, so a long answer. <laughs> Excellent answer. But I... I think that's something that Verb often looks at. It's like, who is needing support in our community? Mm -hmm. What are the stories people are really wanting to hear right now? Yep. Um, we were also like, for this upcoming season, we were looking at Ukrainian stories specifically Absolutely. too, um, and trying to support those artists. Uh, so it's always something to consider and to be really mindful of, mm -hmm. and really mindful of what the audiences want to see. Absolutely. Yeah. So Catherine, how many Shakespeare's are in your next season? <laughs> and why are they all symboling? <laughs> Who knows, maybe one day we'll do a Shakespeare that has like some sort of specific twist. That's a pretty mm -hmm. classic thing for theater. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I, uh, and to kind of jump back to the point of, of as a director, getting into the text of the piece, uh, how do you view that relationship between director and playwright in terms of honoring the piece per se as it written but at the same time putting your own flair and making choices that maybe weren't originally in the script as written yeah uh, something that I am still learning so much about mm -hmm. is that exact thing mm -hmm. I, I was just chatting with them um, Elena Bellier is our lead performer in the mm -hmm. show um, and they're also a playwright like phenomenal playwright outside of the show and performer and we've been talking about that a lot during this process Ooh. Because both of us do work that we often get to work with the playwright in the room. Mm -hmm. I direct a lot of new Canadian work, mm -hmm. meaning the playwright is maybe even a friend of mine mm -hmm. who sits next to me at the table yeah. during rehearsal. So I can like, so like you said, if I'm like have questions about the text or mm -hmm. I want to go in a different direction, I can literally turn to them and be like, I'd like to do this instead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But mm -hmm. I don't think that's actually like a good practice to get used to. Mm -hmm. Because in this show, for example, Young Jean Lee lives in New York, mm -hmm. has no idea who we are. Yeah. I can't easily call Young Jean Lee. I have to talk to her through her agent. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we had questions like, why is this line written like this? Or mm -hmm. why is this in the order that it is mm -hmm. in the story? Um, the answer often is, okay, well, it's written like that for a reason. So let's go back to the text and mm -hmm. figure out why she wrote it this way. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it actually challenges us in a really, really positive way. Mm -hmm. um, and I would also say in terms of like me being able to look at text and go away with it and uh, decide how I could direct it differently mm. than perhaps what's on the page, I think it's a lot of reading. It's sort of trying to read the subtext and read between the lines, so to speak. Yeah. Um, just for the sake of giving people examples of what scripts can look like, mm -hmm. uh, you might have a script from like Ibsen, Ibsen's A Doll's House, yep. um, that I, I, a lot of folks probably recognize the name of. It's having like a bit of a return actually in other theaters right now. Mm -hmm. But A Doll's House has hyper specific set decoration mm -hmm. written into it. Like, like a, I think it's like two and a half pages describing what the layout of the house is. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, you could see that as the playwright being like, this is how it must be done. Mm -hmm. But then after so many productions of that happen, directors start to uh, bridge out from that. Yeah. Um, versus this show, and We're Gonna Die, Young Jean Lee has a paragraph at the start of the script that literally says, uh, all of the stories that in the show are true, not all of them are mine. The, the person performing, it should feel like they are telling their own stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she said, make it work for that performer. Yeah. So if your performer is like, 
uh, oh, I, I uh, there's a story in the show that, as you remember, about <laughs> um, the lead character goes through a big breakup with a boyfriend named Henry. <laughs> So mm -hmm. if I had somebody playing that role who isn't Eli, who was like, oh, can we change Henry to my girlfriend mm -hmm. who's who's named Erica? Like just totally changing it. Mm -hmm. Young Jean Lee has given us the sign off on yeah. doing that. Mm -hmm. um, anyways, I just think it's kind of interesting to consider uh, the thesis of that answer <laughs> is considering is the playwright alive and in the room with yeah. you or do you have to just trust what's on the page? Absolutely. and. Can, is there a pull one way or another? Do you prefer having those more specific scripts that give you, this is what we want, this is how we do it, which, you know, I've heard uh, rumors at least of certain playwrights being like, no, you have these set elements or you're not producing this play versus one that's like, it's like this, please uh, interpret and make your own art with the script. Totally. I don't know if I have a preference. I. I love having, there's certain playwrights that I love working with and certain scripts that uh, will be very, very clear. The script will literally have like no mm -hmm. stage directions and then suddenly there's a ton of stage directions. Mm -hmm. And I know that's the playwright being like, I'd love if you followed this, mm -hmm. but then do whatever you want for the rest of the show. Yeah. So I actually really love that. I love being given a script that has some problem solving and a challenge. Um, there's this like, kind of uh, one of my favorite stories to recall is uh, my friend Michaela Jeffrey, who's a playwright here in town, mm -hmm. um, has this great story. She wrote a script and there's a stage direction about like thousands of moths Ooh. falling from the sky. And when you read that as a, a theater director slash theater designer, mm -hmm. you're like, how do we make that happen? Mm -hmm. Um, and that's actually something I love as a director. Mm -hmm. I love being given something by the playwright that says, um, this magical and ridiculous thing happens on stage and we have to figure out how to convey that to an audience. It's never the playwright's job to tell us like, okay, this is what you're gonna do. You're gonna do like projection mapping and, <laughs> and build a thousand moths. <laughs> like, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think it's, um, I like the challenge when I don't have a lot of uh, specific direction. Yeah, absolutely. And I kind of want to dive into this a, a bit, if that's all right. Yeah, please. Uh, since this is something that in my former artistic practice, I always had, I had some mixed feelings on at times of when you, as a designer versus director, when you have a direction about uh, a design element, like how do you feel about approaching that when it's very rigid versus a script that I find oftentimes, you know, particularly for sound design, there's nothing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that is so true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sound design, there's like, sometimes it'll be like a gunshot and you're like, well, yeah. that could be a real gun on stage or it's a canned gunshot. Exactly. Um, uh, I, you're asking how I respond to it as a designer? Yeah, do you have a different approach per se than uh, as a director I'm looking at like this, but as a designer, mm -hmm. I'm approaching it kind of differently. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as a director, I think I try to encourage designers using like, go, going back to a doll's house, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. uh, as a designer, I'm like, well, I know it has to be uh, what's referred to in theater as a box set. Yep. And you know what a box set is, but I'll just explain it for folks listening. Um, a box set is when you, you go into the theater and you see like a house recreated on stage. There's, there's three walls. Uh, it feels like you're looking at something like quite realistic and it's stationary. It's like often that is the only location that's mm -hmm. going to be seen in the show. Mm -hmm. And those, are, those can be really hard as a designer because you're like, I don't want this to look the same way that it has for every other production of this show. Mm -hmm. So as a designer and director, I think it's about communicating with each other and saying, well, what sets ours apart from other productions? But also what works in this design, like clearly something's working well enough that it makes everybody want to return to this design. Mm -hmm. um, and then what are the details that we get to play with in our mm -hmm. own world? And like, what are the things we can sort of flex on? You know, set design I think is one thing and uh you know, I know you do a bunch of sound design as well. Do, yeah. And, you know, I, I did some myself back in the day. <laughs> uh, I always found that was one of the harder or such gave you more room to play with in terms of a script because 
uh, as I kind of mentioned previously, there was very much nothing there for the playwright a lot of the time. Although I've seen one very rare example um, by a Canadian playwright Hannah Moscovich, if you're familiar mm -hmm. with yes, her, her work, of an entire paragraph explaining the emotion of a sound. Really? Uh, mm -hmm. Do you remember what show? Uh, this is War. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Fantastic piece, but it, it was one of the few times where uh, I feel sound design is an often neglected and yeah. at times unrespected, un Tony Orts, uh, <laughs> area of the theater design. So it's odd for the playwright to really give the consideration to it. But it's pretty incredible when they do. Mm -hmm. um, I it, Verb actually has a play in development right now. Mm -hmm. And that show, uh, Lara Schmitz is a playwright who's mm -hmm. writing it. And the show is called Delayed Deliverance. Um, uh, and she's being really specific about sound, which is quite Ooh. interesting. Mm -hmm. She uh, she talks a lot about aural uh, mm -hmm. experiences throughout the show. Mm -hmm. um, and what it actually, the reason she started to focus on the sound more specifically is because she, actually, she realized it freed her up from trying to explain these like magical, logistically very difficult visuals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I really do think, uh, uh, transforms the show in a, such a beautiful way, exploring sound, exploring how sound impacts an audience and the emotion of an audience too. Yeah. I agree though, it's very rare to have to have those specific directions. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Said, everyone cares about sound. <laughs> yeah, we can, we can deal with that later. Yeah, totally. Um, to kind of cir circle back a bit, uh, doing new work, I feel like that's a much different process than when you have an established play that's been workshopped and uh, done several times. Uh, personally, I, f I find when I've gone to see new works, oftentimes there's, there's bits of it that sometimes feel like that didn't work or they, they still are trying to figure out how to convey like the overall themes. Mm -hmm. Is that something you'd agree with? Oh, 100%. I could talk about new work for a very long time, <laughs> but what I, I will say that I really think people should hear mm -hmm. um, is, I think that's so important to have new work go up in front of an audience mm -hmm. and for the creative team and the playwright and the audience to experience something and go, that didn't feel like it worked or like there's something that's not lining up in this show for me or being conveyed to me properly. The reason I think that's important is because a lot of people are like, let's develop the show and then we'll put the show on and then it, that's it, now mm -hmm. it's done. Yeah. This idea that it's like a film that's like it's been pressed and released and now it's out in the world. It's like theater is like a living art form. It's a living thing that can change. Mm -hmm. So I actually like to think of new work when it goes up for its first audience that it's more like a workshop presentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and you should have the ability to treat that as a learning experience, being able to go away with the show, change and alter what you need to and then try it again. Absolutely. Yeah. I, f I feel it's still di difficult of like, once you've done that, to again, pull a piece uh, that maybe you've seen elsewhere or whatnot, and give it that second, uh, second performance that really needs to form part of the corpus of Canadian theater. Yeah. I think it is difficult, and I think a, a struggle is that if, if a company does a show that's new, mm -hmm. and if that show has some some holes or some challenges in it, mm -hmm. it's hard for the company to like bring it back like next season. People mm -hmm. are like, well, we saw it already. I don't. So that's the that's the game. That's the balancing yeah. act that a lot of companies have to play is how much you workshop workshop something. Sorry, before you present it to an mm -hmm. audience. Absolutely, I think there's a big conversation that's, you know. It's been ongoing forever, but particularly in the last few years, about the voice of Canadian theater. Mm -hmm. um, in that, you know, we're we're very much the Greco-Roman tradition theater, very much influenced by European, but recognizing the broader storytellings of this land, like through Aboriginal theater traditions and the fact that we are a multicultural country and other theater traditions. Mm -hmm. How does that kind of play in, like, to you as an AD of? A Canadian theater company of finding that voice and uh, kind of respecting those different traditions? Yeah, it, it's a great question. I think a lot of theater companies right now are trying to think of how to, to do that. Um, 
it's so funny. I yes, we are a theater company based in Canada, mm -hmm. but I also think like um, to to consider us like a Canadian theater company specifically. Mm -hmm. So I'm less interested in looking into the Canadian identity and more interested in seeing the individual identities that are in the country that mm -hmm. we reside in. Mm -hmm. um, so indigenous work, like mm -hmm. looking at like the actual roots, the actual history of mm -hmm. this country, mm -hmm. um, but also the people who have immigrated here, people who uh, have really helped form this country that we're in. Mm -hmm. And within that too, then starting to look at like, what are things that we want to see change mm -hmm. in this in this country? Um, things that we're we want to have discussion about and a conversation about. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I think um, for Verb in particular, we look less at broad topics of discussion mm -hmm. and more at like the really like specific conversations that people can have that lead to those broader conversations. Absolutely. If that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. So for next season, we should expect some about oil workers and uh, cowboys, right? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, perfect. All the time. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's what Calgary is, right? Yeah. But, um, but a bit about that, like what does your next season look like if you can tell us a bit about that? I uh, can talk about it a little bit. Yeah. yeah. So, Sneak peek. Uh, so one thing I can say for sure mm -hmm. uh, is we have a really exciting co-pro, so co-production yeah. with two other companies in town. We're going to be working with Downstage Theater and Handsome Alice mm. Theater mm -hmm. um, and doing a show uh, in late February into March. Mm -hmm. And the show's called Beautiful Man. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's about, it, it flips the narrative on its head about like um, popular media, a lot of like film and like traditional theater writing, mm -hmm. how women are often used as this uh, object or this trope character mm -hmm. and it flips it so it's it becomes three women talking about men the way that they've heard men talk about women mm -hmm. um, it's very satirical so it like takes what i just said and dials it up to like 10. good, good. Uh, but it's it's gonna be a really really interesting piece it's quite funny mm -hmm. really impactful and like brings up great conversation, mm. I think, about um, mm. about those like gender uh, challenges that mm -hmm. we face. Um, so that'll be happening uh, in the Motel Theatre in uh, late February to March, and you mm. can check out Downstage, Handsome Alice, yeah. or our website for more details. Mm -hmm. So that's one production we're doing. I can't say what our other production is yet, but okay. we're also developing a few different shows. Excellent. Yeah, so like I said, we've got uh, Delayed Deliverance is being written by Laura Schmitz. Mm -hmm. um, that's like a queer femme sci-fi exploration. Ooh. I know. <laughs> so I'm really excited about that. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to keep working with that show, putting it through some workshops. Um, mm -hmm. Who knows, maybe we'll be able to have like a public reading of it. Yeah. Um, but when things are in development, we're like, we'll just see how much development you need. Yeah, and then, so. yeah. And then we'll have one more slot available for a development piece, um, which is to be decided. Okay. We, yeah. We'll see what, well, how that goes. That, that's so exciting that you're really working to create that new work and can you just filtering that back through and creating the work you want to do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We're really, we're really, really excited. And I should also say that we will have a fundraiser again next season. Mm -hmm. um, last year, this this past mm -hmm. fall, we did a fundraiser called My First Play. Mm -hmm. and that's where we invited artists to come and read early works that they had or Exciting. read from like their yes. journals from when they were kids. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really fun, really like laid back, informal community event where you just hear artists mm -hmm. read stuff that was like, not great. <laughs> you know, when they're, but, yeah. but in like the most wonderful way that's like, yeah. comes with that, um, that innocence and, and like fascination with art from when you're a kid. Totally. So, but we'll be, uh, we'll be announcing the rest of our season really, really soon. Oh, well. Yeah, probably uh, in the next month. Very exciting. Hopefully coming out about the same time this recording oh, comes yeah. out, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, kind of some broader quest, more fun questions. Uh, very curious, like, Catherine, is there a piece you have in mind, like, if you could direct anything you wanted, right. what would that be and why? Oh, uh, such a good question. I think I would love 
to do, I, it's funny, I referenced um, specifically like a 50 person musical. <laughs> no musical comes to mind specifically, but I actually love the idea of being able to do a large scale um, production that features a lot of queer artists mm -hmm. and features music prominently. So mm -hmm. this is starting to sound like something that I just need to make myself. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's currently, I don't know if it exists. Fair enough. Um, so that's my creation answer of what I'd love to direct is something in that vein, mm -hmm. uh, heavy on like community and music and yep. bringing folks together. But if I was picking a show that already exists, mm -hmm. I would love to direct a version of The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, it's one of my favorite stories of all time. Like, and are you keeping it more in line with the traditional telling of it, uh, or like bring in some of the wicked elements? I think I. Yeah, I'd be curious to bring in my own sort of flair and take on the story mm -hmm. specifically. Uh, yeah, I, it's, it's one of those stories that's like, it's so classic that now when people see it, it's almost like, oh, I wish it was like the original one. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'd be curious how we could um, turn it on its head a little bit. Okay, yeah. very exciting. And, you know, I'd be remiss uh, to end this conversation before we talk about uh, a little bit about your amazing singing songwriting career. Uh, uh, so, KP Smith, the musician, like, yeah. tell us a bit about your, your work through that and kind of like where your artistic process maybe is a bit different from being a director, uh, where you're guiding a team of people versus, you know, just the pure raw creative force. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's funny, um, my songwriting and music has largely started to shift over and meld with um, my theater practice oh. too. Mm -hmm. um, for this show, for example, we worked with the music director, Miranda Martini, mm -hmm. but I also was uh, a pretty heavy music voice in the room mm -hmm. to help guide and shape the songs how we wanted them to be. Um, and I use, so I use a lot of my music ability when I'm directing a show but I also, hope when I design, when I sound design and do composition, mm -hmm. I'm often writing lyrics and writing original music for the shows that I work on. Mm -hmm. So it's, that's why I would say they started to like kind of bleed together. But when I'm just writing music, it's a totally, I feel like I'm a very different artist. Okay. It's a much more insular process, mm -hmm. I, uh, but really fun and really energizing. Absolutely. But it looks so different. like. The rest of my work is about talking to people and communicating my ideas to them. And mm -hmm. songwriting is about communicating my ideas to myself through my lyrics and then trying to show them to people and be like, I hope you like it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. So that's, I, I think that's the biggest difference. I love songwriting. Mm -hmm. I love playing music. Mm -hmm. It's a different style of performance altogether than theater, but they, they line up in so many different ways. Absolutely. At the end of the day, the reason I love both of them so much is because it is the opportunity to do something live and to mm -hmm. connect with an audience mm -hmm. in that moment. 100%. Yeah. Is there any upcoming work that you have kind of like in the studio or is that kind of on the back burner while you're directing is yeah. more? <laughs> it's a little bit on the back burner, but Fair. I am mm -hmm. working on two music-based theater shows mm -hmm. and I'm writing the music for them. Excellent. So Excellent. Uh, one show is, um, it's a retelling of the Garden of Eden uh, through a queer perspective and I'm writing all of the music and lyrics for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other show, I actually, Lars Schmitz, the playwright I was talking about before, mm -hmm. who's doing Delayed Deliverance, um, we're writing a show together uh, we're writing a musical together. Ooh. Yeah. So, and that'll be uh, the workshop presentation of it will be through Lunchbox Theater's Stage One mm -hmm. Festival. Um, and their Stage One Festival will feature five other shows along with ours uh, that are in their very, very early stages of creation. 100%. But uh, by the time this goes up, we'll probably be closer to those dates. Yeah. And our date is June 16th. They mm -hmm. have two weekends back to back. So, mm -hmm. the previous weekend. Mm -hmm. which I think is like the 8th, 9th, 10th, and then the 16th, 17th, 18th, they'll have showcases of those shows. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. And I was curious, um, when you write original music for, for the your piece, do you ever have the impulse to be like, okay, I need to record this as well because I want these songs to exist more than just in this piece, or do you feel like, no, they are the piece, they're their separate thing. When we do the off-Broadway tour, that's when we'll record oh. it. <laughs> 
Uh, it's funny. I, I also produce and record my own music. Mm -hmm. So it, it's <laughs> when I write new music, I like sort of have to record it mm -hmm. is part of it. But then to do like an actual proper recording, mm -hmm. um, if I have the time and the money and the interest is there, I love to record them. I, I don't have to wait for the for the Broadway. Perfect. <laughs> so what you're saying is I can pick up a CD after the show yeah, when they come. Yeah, absolutely. Out. <laughs> It'll just be me singing on it. But uh, oh, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, we can wait for the cast recording. Okay, we're, great. We're, yeah, we're, yeah, once yeah. we once we have the perfect cast, then. Excellent. Yeah. Yes, and then I'll have all of the CDs. <laughs> well, Catherine, thank you so much for sitting down with me today. This has been excellent. Um, where can people find you online? Yeah. <laughs> So Verb Theater, we have an Instagram and a Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, our Instagram is just at Verb Theater. Mm -hmm. uh, look us up there. We're very active on Instagram. Uh, and our Facebook, if you search Verb Theater, you will find us no problem. Uh, look for the logo that is blue with a V. Easy. Mm -hmm. um, and then for my own stuff, my, my personal artistic practice, if people are curious, you can also find me on Instagram at Hey, it's KP Smith. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where I keep most of my music updates as well as theater crossover updates there too. So, Wonderful. Thank you so much, Catherine. And thank you for tuning in for this episode of PL Talks. Awesome. Thanks, awesome. Reese. Thank you.